Good afternoon. I'm Tamika Brown Nagan, the Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Welcome to this year's Kim and Judy Davis Lecture in the Sciences, featuring renowned neuroscientist Dr. Mu Ming Pu. Mu Ming is the founding director of the Chinese Academy of Sciences Institute of Neuroscience in Shanghai and senior investigator in the Institute's Laboratory of Neuroplasticity. He also leads the Academy's Center for Excellence in Brain Science and Intelligence, Intelligent Technology. Before relocating to Shanghai, Mu Ming worked as a researcher and professor in the United States for close to 40 years. And he's the Paul Licht D Distinguished Professor in Biology Emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley. Mu Ming is well known for the breadth and innovativeness, innovativeness excuse me, of his scholarship. His research has drawn insights from both physics and biology, and he's made critical contributions to several subfields of neuroscience. Mu Ming has shaped our understanding of the neurobiology of learning and memory, and of the brain's ability to adapt over time, known as plasticity. For his work in this area, Mu Ming received the 2016 Neuroscience Prize from the Gruber Foundation at Yale University. More recently, Mu Ming has focused on developing non-human primate models of brain diseases, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, to advance scientific understanding and eventually to treat these diseases more effectively. The development of non-human primate models is potentially more fraught and certainly more complex than it might sound. This work involves both gene editing and cloning primates, and the resultant ethical questions have certainly captured public attention. A common starting point in conversations on this topic is the observation that animal models have been and are powerful tools in biomedical research. Non-human primate models represent the next phase, advocates argue, promising critical insights into human neurobiology that other avenues cannot. Some ask whether the ethics of gene-edited and cloned animals should vary across species. For example, is the cloning of primates for research ethically different from the cloning of rodents? Another common and important question is whether the cloning of non-human primates might open the door to human cloning and therefore a whole host of other ethical considerations. Now, I won't attempt to answer these questions, trust me. Yet, what's clear is that there's a complex interplay between scientific advancement and the web of standards, international, national, institutional, and indeed moral, that aim to ensure ethical research practices. This isn't a theoretical discussion alone. Last year, the Institute of Neuroscience that Mu Ming directs announced it had produced the first ever primate clones via the technique of somatic cell nuclear transfer. The result, a pair of genetically identical macaque monkeys. Earlier this year, Mu Ming and his colleagues shared that they'd successfully disabled a gene in macaque monkeys related to the sleep-wake cycle and then created the world's first clones of a gene-edited primate. These are watershed moments for science and technology, forcing factors for ethical debates and opening to potentially game-changing biomedical research. I hope that today's lecture will be an opportunity for us all to engage with the scientific possibilities and the ethical questions at hand. Before I turn things over to Mu Ming, I want to extend my thanks to Kim and Judy Davis for their generous support of the Radcliffe Institute and of the Dean's Lecture Series. I'm also grateful to the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and to all our annual donors uh, who make the work of the Institute possible. Thank you very much for your support. And now, please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Mu Ming Pu. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Brown uh, Negan, 
for this uh, very nice introduction and a very insightful comment at the end. And I hope I would have time to discuss this about the ethical issues. Uh, many uh, worthwhile debates uh, and uh, consideration should be given to uh, the future research in the non-human primates. But begin with uh, my talk, I would show you what we think uh, the usefulness of the, uh, uh, this model system would be. Um, uh, let's begin with the brain, the human brain, probably the most uh, mysterious uh, objects on Earth. Now, I, I heard that la last week you have a lecture on the outer universe, on the uh, uh, astrophysical uh, astro uh, astronomy aspects. Now, this is the inner universe, uh, e equally mysterious. And we uh, uh, hope to understand how the, the brain functions. Now, the, the outer uh, cover of the brain, the so-called the, the, uh, cerebral cortex, is the most developed in, uh, in the primate species. The inner part, uh, more complex ancient, evolutionary ancient part, uh, are very similar to other species, in mammalian species, as uh, rodents. Uh, but this outer cerebral cortex is the seat of humanness. It, pro uh, uh, it produces uh, many complex uh, functions uh, of the higher cognitive function of the brain. And that's what we need to understand. Now, the, uh, the brain is very complicated networks of uh, nerve connections. The human brain is composed of about uh, 100, uh, uh, 10 to the 11th, uh, nerve cells or neurons, and each cell is making connections with uh, at least a thousand other cells, making 10 to the 14th total uh, number of synapses in the brain. This form a very complex interconnected network. Within this network, there's neural circuits, specific pathways of signaling that are responsible for uh, specific brain functions. Now, in the cortex, there are the, 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 here is a, a drawing by uh, Romani uh, hundred more than 100 years ago, only a few cells in the cortex. In fact, this cortex is packed with this network. They are not only complex uh, connections, the cell types are complicated. Uh, there are at least hundreds of different cell types in the, in the brain. The extent of diversity is yet to be figured out, and many of people are still working out. Uh, Josh Sands here is one of the pioneers in this area, trying to figure out how many different types are there in the, in the brain. And there are different morphology, and there are different in physiology, in their firing patterns. Now, all these uh, differences gives the complexity of the signal processing. Just an example, here is the 52 cells from a mouse cortex. 50 cortical neurons, we only plot the projection, the long range connection of these neurons. Of 52 uh, cells across the entire brain, you can see the complexity. Uh, we, we label different uh, neurons with different colors. Now you think about billions of cells in the human brain, uh, all with all the connections around and carry out different functions. To figure this out is really uh, is the daunting task. Now, uh, eventually, we like to know, to understand at least three levels of cognitive process. Now, I would say these three levels can be, can be distinguished as a cognition of the outside world. It's just, this is a, uh, uh, nearly all the animal does it. They need to recognize the, the external world in order to survive, in order to respond appropriately. This includes the sensory perception, uh, signal from the environment, integration of multiple sensory signals, transform the sensory signal into a response, a sensory motor transformation, attention to a particular uh, stimulus from the, stimu from the environment, memorize the, the experience, learning and memory categorize different, different uh, objects in the, in the environment, or making decisions. All these are, uh, uh, many animals have these uh, functions. So you can use many model, animal model systems from worm to flies to rodents uh, to, uh, to monkeys and humans. And so this is the cognition, I say, the first level of cognition. But there's another level of cognition that's called the cognition of self and non-self. 
this is more complex, and you, we need to uh, perform co uh, complex exactly function in dealing with a uh, lot of uh, peoples in the world. Uh, we need to have self-awareness. We know self from among self. We have empathy of feelings of others. We have co complex social behavior. We have theory of mind, knowing what other people are thinking. All of these are cognition based on very important aspects, knowing yourself from others. And that's the basis of all social behavior. Now, this is not all animal has it. I mean, we're, we can uh, give an example in just a minute about, about empathy. But it's probably best studied in non human primates, closer to human, with all this complex uh, uh, cognition. Now, finally, there's another level of cognition. I would say this is the uh, jewel of the crown. That is the language. And this is the ability to have vocal communications that are very complex with syntax and grammar, open-ended construction of sentences. Many, many animals can have vocal communication. Even chimps can learn <laughs> hundreds of symbols corresponding to different things. But chimps were never able to learn to form sentences with syntax and grammar. Right? This is uh, well proven over the last many decades of work with teaching chimps to, uh, to uh, the human language. So this is a human specific. And uh, uh, we can study this by looking at humans with injured language dysfunction. But that's very limited. But the mechanism studies, you need perturbation that are uh, uh, experimentally controlled. So how do you study language uh, circuits uh, in the brain? Perhaps monkey would be. You might be able to study the evolution of language, early, early prototype of language in monkeys. For example, we are now teaching monkeys to learn sequences. Uh, reverse sequence is a recursive structure of symbols. Uh, the monkey, monkey can learn to do this. Uh, and, and what happened to their brain when they learned to do this primitive uh, language construction? Uh, what happened to the brain? Is, is there any way of constructing a, uh, 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 the circuits that are more capable than simple vocal communication? These are the problems that one can study with, with uh, uh, non-human primates. Empathy. Empathy is a very big word, very important. The power to understand and, and imaginatively enter into another person's feelings and identify with that feelings. And this is uh, very human. And, and there are many levels of empathy if you look at the evolution. Now, the very primitive form of empathy which has emotion contagious, uh, contagion, mimicry, or sympathy and compassion, uh, pro-social behavior. This can be found in many animal systems. I mean, you can have examples that very much uh, show this behavior. Perspective taking, that's a little bit difficult. And to know what other, uh, other people are thinking. One of the things is the gaze following. If you're looking at the, each other's eye and you then shift and shift your gaze to a different direction, that person would turn their head and see what they were looking. They, the person would know, if they know what you are thinking, this type of gaze following is, uh, is uh, this uh, uh, perspective taking. Right? All this, uh, the higher you go, it's more difficult. Now, in the monkey, they are, they are, there's a very interesting set of systems developed in the, in the primate system. First discovered in the monkey called mirror neuron. A monkey would uh, have neurons in their motor cortex, premotor cortex. This neuron will fire if they grab something, but they also fire when somebody else grabs something. It shows the same motion. Uh, the monkey, the same neuron would fire when the monkey is doing itself or seeing other other monkey doing it, or other human being doing it. Uh, this is called mirror neurons found in monkey first. And the, in the human, uh, if you do functional MRI uh, imaging, brain imaging, you can find that when people show empathy, there are specific areas in the brain uh, active. Right? That's, that can be shown. So there are very specific. Now, lower, and, uh, lower species, let's say uh, rodents, uh, no, there's no convincing evidence that rodents are, show this empathy-like uh, uh, neural structure. Right, so uh, one can look at empathy. There's a gradient of empathy from the uh, affective, uh, the just emotional empathy, feeling other, other, other uh, parties' uh, uh, injury, for example, the, the pain, or gradually to the higher empathy, we call cognitive empathy, that the perspective-taking, theory of mind. 
uh, uh, the understanding of what other people are thinking. These are higher level of empathy. They all depend the higher you go to the right, it's uh, the more dependent on your self and non-self uh, distinction. You know, to know other people different from you, that's a self and uh, non-self distinction. This is a, uh, a gradient, probably, uh, of um, evolution of this cap capacity. So it would be nice to, to understand the, the circuit basis, uh, knowing the, how these are de developed. Now, self-awareness, there's a way to test it. Whether the, well, one uh, traditionally the last 40 years, the uh, 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 primate biologists or, or, or animal of behavior studies have shown you can uh, actually uh, use a mirror self-recognition as a way to show self-awareness. Now, if you put a, a dial or, or, or a, a marker on the face of a two-year-old kid and giving, giving her the mirror, she, should, he will, she will scratch that mark. That's called face mark test. Knowing that the, the, what she is seeing in the, in the mirror is herself, and this ability of, uh, of mirror self-recognition uh, will, be, will appear in 85% of the kids by two years old. But if you test by one year old or one and a half year old, the majority of them cannot do it. In fact, in one year old kids, very few can do this mirror self-recognition. So what happened? The, what happened to the baby's brain when they were able to do self-recognition? Is it known or is it inborn? Is there, once they develop to a certain stage, they will have this ability. Now this will be useful. So we thought that uh, if we can make a, a monkey develop this ability, then we might be able to, to figure out well, well, how, the, how the monkey uh, develop this self-awareness. Because the monkey can never do this, can never pass this mirror self-recognition test. Put a mark on the monkey's face. Even with a mirror in the, in the cage from the early uh, 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 period after birth, throughout life, they, the monkey would never learn. So this was an experiment demonstrated for 40 years. This hasn't been uh, successful. So uh, we thought that uh, this would be useful because uh, there are some psychiatric patients or autistic patients, they appear to be uh, impaired in this test if you do this face mark test. It's not clear whether they are just not interested in in the, in the face, their own face, or they fail to recognize themselves. This is unclear. So it would be uh, nice to know what self-awareness uh, as reflected by mirror self-recognition is. Uh, uh, so this is an experiment. So two colleagues of mine uh, decided to put, uh, to train a monkey sitting in front of a mirror. Here is a monkey sitting in front with head fixed. And and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Len Gong and, uh, and the student Chen put a laser pointer from the side on his face. This is a higher power laser, gives it a little bit of warm feelings. So the monkey would feel, see a spot in the mirror and a feeling of warmness on the face. So they make connections, association between the mirror image and their own body. Right? So this is the, how the experiment is done. I see if we can see this. So they were rewarding. In the beginning, they, 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 don't, they don't know their connection. So it takes training. A few weeks, they start to know the association, and they would be awarded with, uh, if they touch that spot correctly. Right? So now, once they are trained after a few uh, weeks, you can do a face mark test. They pass it. Right. Actually, five out of seven monkeys pass the face mark test once they can do this in, the, in front of a mirror. That's, that's show that they can. They now, uh, they, the face mark test is they scratch their face with a mark uh, in front of face. But the primatologists, such as uh, Franz Duval, uh, people in, you know, studying primate biology, they don't agree with this. this is a, they, thought, they think that this is a conditional response. The, the monkey just uh, conditioned to do this when they see a spot, to do this on their face. So training to touch the face is a condition, condition the monkey, so the monkey may not recognize themselves. It's just a response. So we have to do another experiment later. This experiment, we do not 
touch the face. We, our laser spot is on the back of the, on the backboard. The monkey have to, to touch, looking at the image, touch that spot uh, precisely and quickly. Once they touch it right, they get a reward. Now, in the beginning, they cannot do it. They don't know where that's, their hands are. By chance, their hands in the right spot, they get reward. Right? So after many, many weeks, very slow, many weeks, they are establishing, they begin to know that the image of the hands in the mirror is their own hand. So you have a, they, they, they move their hands with their joints. So they have a self-body awareness. That self-body awareness is linked with the, the image in the, in the mirror. So then they suddenly aware that that image is themselves. Now we do mirrors, face tests. Now we never train the face, right? Uh, never trying to touch the face. The face mark test is this, this training. Now we you know, secretly put just some dye on the face of the uh, uh, on a, on monkey, and in, in, in the cage, they see this, they will touch that spot. Right? This, is a, this is a standard. Uh, people think this is a, uh, means they recognize themselves. They are spontaneous activity that put in their hairs. We, we never trained it. They sit in front of the mirror, they would put, put their head. And they become interested in, their, in places <laughs> they have never, never seen before. Right? So the... Uh, <laughs> right. So the, uh, the, the one with the yellow collar, that was an untrained monkey, it was sitting in the same cage for half a year, never learned. He just, just watching the other monkey do all this, he would never show, we do a face mark that they never acquire the ability. So without establishing this association between the face, uh, the mirror image and then themselves, they would never learn that's, that, that is, uh, that represent themselves. So the, the implication of this study is that monkey can learn mirror self-recognition. Now this, uh, Mirror self recognition was used by many uh, animal uh, behaviors to be a sign of self awareness. If they can show this, that the animal to have self awareness. But our study seems to say that the mirror self recognition is only an experimental tool to reveal self awareness. The monkey is learning to associate themselves with the mirror image. Once they learn that, they can use the mirror as a way to reveal themselves. We reveal the self-awareness, right? So the self-awareness maybe uh, can be uh, uh, in many animals. It's just we have to find a way to reveal that. The mirror self-recognition is just an experimental way of revealing that. Right? So this is actually twist the original idea of using mirror self-recognition as a, as a tool for, uh, as a sign for uh, self-awareness. So now, impaired mirror self-recognition in patients, in autistic or schizophrenia patients, is that uh, indicating defective visual or proprioceptive uh, association, or rather than a, a lack of self-awareness? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question now, again, we need to, to, to show. Maybe we can train them train the association or find a way of to, reveal, uh, to establish the association if that's a defective aspect. So this could be a, a, a mirror self-recognition, maybe a way of, of therapeutic tools, let's say, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, help these patients. Now finally, the babies. Now, so the baby is two years old. Why two years old? It turns out that during that period, the babies start to, to be aware of this. So uh, uh, after our experiment was published, uh, a, a uh, colleague of, uh, uh, of uh, Stanislas de Hong, uh, Sid uh, Codder, in Paris, he started to think that maybe the baby can be trained. So he took one-year-old baby, put a, a wrist, wristwatch, which gives uh, some uh, touching sensation, but with a light on the watch. So the baby will see a light in the mirror and some feeling on the hand. And the baby learns. One-year-old baby, many of them learn quickly, much faster than the than, than monkey. <laughs> so so, it's, so the, this learning, uh, the, uh, the ability of mirror self-recognition is probably uh, a learned experience. I mean, they start to understand what it means 
the, the parents telling, oh, look at a baby in the mirror, a baby in the mirror. After a while, they know that that's, 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 uh, that means themselves. So maybe that's how they learn. Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, inter still interesting for the cognitive development. Uh. So now, another twist of my, 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 uh, my uh, presentation. I want to talk about social burden of various brain diseases. According to WHO, the brain disease is now counting number one in just overall, all the brain diseases together. Um, have uh, counting about 28% of all the uh, social burden, higher than cancer and uh, cardiovascular disease. Now this is uh, uh, important for aging society, the uh, neurodegenerative disease and also for the modern society, depression and addic addiction problems all together is very uh, a problem we have to face. Now to understand all the uh, the basis, scientific basis, and the pathogenesis mechanism of this disease, it may take many, many decades. We still don't know exactly how the uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease is developed, uh, what is really the, the, the causal uh, factors. So uh, one need to have uh, therapies urgently within the next 20, 30 years. Otherwise, the medical care system will, will be bankrupt. And so this is the uh, problems we are facing. The problem facing brain disease treatments, pathogenic mechanisms are unclear, so it, uh, including many neurological and psychiatric diseases, but it takes decades to figure it out. It's also difficult to identify specific drug targets because all the, many of the dysfunction is specific circuits dysfunction. Now all these uh, brain circuits are formed by similar neurons even though there are many diverse types, and similar synapses. Uh, so the, 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 it's hard to find specific targets that address circuit dysfunction. Right? So, so this is a, a difficulty. There's also very slow to develop uh, the uh, drugs. I mean, ten, up to 10 years for development costs billions, and the failure rate for uh, brain disease drugs it's more than 90%. Some people say more than 95% or even 99%. Right? So uh, uh, the, one of the main reasons is inappropriate animal model for preclinical drug testing. Now, before you go into clinical trial, you have to do three types of tests. You, you test the safety of the drug or the metabolism, like the, the metabol metabolism of the drug in the, in the animal, uh, or you do, uh, and also you test the drug efficacy. Large animals like, uh, like uh, um, uh, macaque monkeys are used for safety tests and drug metabolism because they are close to humans. But the drug efficacy tests are all tested on, on rodents because only rodents have disease models, brain disease models. And that uh, appears to be inappropriate now uh, because their physiology and their, uh, their anatomy are so different from human that's why many of the uh, drug, the positive drug efficacy tests in preclinical animal studies failed in the clinical test. So uh, this is one of the reasons I think uh, having animal models is very important. So since uh, 2001, the transgenic gene, gene editing monkeys has, uh, has appeared. And you have many different types. You can have overexpression of uh, uh, human genes in monkeys. Disease gene monkeys producing disease phenotypes. Uh, you can do uh, now editing, ge genetic editing, CRISPR-Cas9 type gene editing in monkeys. You produce a specific gene knockout or even knock in. Um, all this allowed the uh, uh, possibility. Now we can edit the the embryos of the uh, uh, monkeys and produce progenies that have disease phenotype. Uh, so I will uh, show you some example today on these uh, studies. Now the first example I want to show you is a MECP2 transgenic monkey. And this is a, 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 a protein. MECP2 is a protein identified by Huda Zombie to be the origin of the causal uh, gene for um, rat syndrome, right? the mutation of this gene causes rat syndrome. Uh, primarily, uh, uh, a, a, a subcategory of aut autism. 
Now, overexpression uh, in uh, duplication of this gene also found to have some uh, uh, artistic uh, phenotype. Right? So we decided a few years ago to overexpress a human MECP2 in monkey and just hopefully to get some artistic, artistic phenotype in the monkey for studying the development of autism and perhaps even therapy of autism. So this uh, we uh, express using a neuron-specific promoter, AVV viral uh, transfection in the, uh, the expression in the uh, oocyte, uh, the uh, monkey oocyte, and then in vitro fertilize the oocyte. Uh, and then take the uh, uh, developed embryo and implant it in a surrogate mother to get offspring. So we obtain uh, a number of um, these transgenic monkey, actually seven of them. Uh, the seven monkeys all have transgene, the extra human genes uh, inserted in different chromosomes. So you will see that they are randomly inserted with different variable copies in different chromosomes from, uh, in the monkey. Now, these uh, monkeys show phenotype, uh, show their behavior phenotype. Uh, you can show that the, the, this, uh, there's a specific expression of this transgene uh, in this uh, specifically in neurons, uh, in nerve cells. Now, the one of the phenotype is that they seem to show abnormal locomotive uh, phenotype. They tend to make circular motions in the cage uh, much more than the usual wild-type monkeys. Uh, these are the, uh, the transgenic monkeys, clearly move a lot, a lot uh, doing circular, maybe stereotype, we can say, stereotype motions in the cage uh, constantly. Over, and this we consider, this is a, uh, uh, similar to our, uh, the stereotype uh, motions of autistic patients. Now, they also show high anxiety uh, using this uh, threat-related anxiety and defense test, facing the monkey, gaze uh, eye to eye, uh, induce the monkey will show anxiety by by their vocalization, the grunts. The grunts uh, produ production is highly elevated in these transgenic monkeys, uh, showing a higher anxiety. This is a standard uh, anxiety test in monkeys. And the most importantly, the social behavior. And this is one of the, one of the key for autistic phenotype. When these monkeys are in a group, uh, these transgenic monkeys, showing here, on the, uh, showing here with, uh, uh, interact much less than the wild type monkey. They interact uh, uh, in pairs. If you take two monkeys in an isolated new cage, they in, in, interact uh, very little with each other, uh, much lower than their interaction with the wild type or interaction between wild type. So this is a clear social uh, uh, dysfunction in this uh, monkey. Uh, you can also test the uh, cognitive function, the, uh, the so-called uh, WGTA cognition, cognition test, but mostly memory test. Uh, you can see that in all these memory tests, they, they are doing on the average okay, uh, similar to the wild type monkey, but they're highly variable. Right? All these uh, transgenic, seven transgenic varies a lot, while the, the, in the wild type, they are very much a clear uh, cluster in, in, in the similar. Right? They, they are, seem to be slower in learning, but they, uh, they eventually can learn. So the, there's not big difference in the cognitive. Uh, function except of high variability. So this is a problem. They say you have a transgenic with the, the uh, insertion of a, uh, a, a human gene at different places uh, with different uh, variable copies in different chromosomes. The phenotype is diverse. So that's not a good model. Now we cannot do experiments where you compare uh, experimental with, uh, with, uh, with a, with a uh, uh, control. We can also generate second generation of the monkey, uh, uh, obtain uh, the, a, uh, one of the monkey that, that germline transmission uh, uh, yielded five monkeys, which also show similar chromosome uh, uh, insertion persisted in the second generation. Their social, social 
interaction also reduced in the second generation. So this is a, uh, a phenotype that transmitted um, through germline. Now that's the first example. The second example is, is a little bit more interesting to me. It's the uh, circadian rhythm disorder. As you know that we have a daily cycle, uh, day, uh, day uh, with a metabolism, very, very distinct difference in metabolism during the day and during the evening, controlled by a group of circadian rhythm gene, transcription factor, that cyclic, that shows cyclic uh, expression in, a, in, in, the, uh, in all the tissues. Uh, so this uh, defective uh, circadian regulatory genes, such as PER2, BML1, clock gene, these are all the key transcription factors resulted in many different diseases, right, including premature aging, and also neurodegenerative disease. For example, here, the circadian disorder is found in the, uh, in the uh, AD patients and uh, Huntington disease patients, that they don't sleep well. Right? That this is well known. Uh, the controlled day, day uh, clear daylight rhythm uh, disappeared in these patients. They are cycling hormones in their blood, such as uh, uh, melatonin, are also reduced, dampened in their oscillation. And the uh, BMEL1 expression, one of these transcription factors, are, are clearly reduced in uh, Parkinson's disease patients. So we decided this might be a very key protein that affect many, of the f many functions that may be of interest, uh, as including brain disease. So we, put, we knock out this, this function by editing uh, the, uh, using CRISPR-Cas9 editing, uh, injected in the fertilized egg, fertilized uh, embryo, uh, monkey embryo, and then uh, have embryo developed in vitro and then transplanted in surrogate mother produce the offspring. Now the offspring produce, some of them show complete knockout of this protein uh, with uh, basically no expression of uh, uh, BMEL1. Some with partial knockout or the mosaic knockout because CRISPR-Cas9 editing sometimes doesn't work in all cells, in only part of the embryonic uh, cells. So you have an uh, embryo that has partial uh, knockout. And so this we call mosaic. This is one of the standard uh, findings in this uh, technology. Uh, so we, uh, we sh found that this um, uh, knockout monkey with the BML9 carbon show uh, defective uh, daylight locomotive activity. Usually uh, in wild type monkey, it's very clear uh, uh, day activity, no activity at night, but in, in the knockout monkey, it's more spread out, and you can see more activity during the, during the night. Their period of activities also show abnormality. Different, many different uh, periodicity of locomotion appeared in this uh, knockout monkey. More clearly is the sleep patterns. Now, in the uh, wake, uh, the, uh, the, mon uh, the knockout monkey uh, wake more during the day, uh, during the night, and the, uh, the amount of non-REM sleep, non-eye movement sleep, all the eye movement sleep are all reduced in the knockout monkey. And, and the more, it's also more exaggerated if you do a, 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 a three-night complete uh, uh, daylight for three days, and this, uh, this, this distinction between uh, the sleep pattern is even more exaggerated. You can see that they are very much reduced REM sleep and non-REM sleep. So sleep disorder. Now, more interesting uh, is that the circadian rhythm that we found in the normal animals are much more dampened in melatonin, uh, testosterone, DHEA, and an interesting stress hormone, the cortisol in the blood, are uh, flat in the knockout monkey. Now this is very interesting. A uh, high level of cortisol retained in this monkey. It turns out that this is directly uh, the cause for the, another phenotype we're seeing, it is stress and depression. We can see that these monkey are all hiding in a corner they tend to be uh, off the ground more time, uh, 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 leaving the ground. While the wild type monkey moves around, uh, or moves around, but this monkey all stay at one region, move very, very little. Right? So this is a stress, in particular when they are 
human being, the, uh, the animal care person comes in to feed. The normal monkey comes in and move and, and look for the food. And the, the, the uh, monkey with knockouts, hiding, always goes to the corner and hide themselves. That will show this very depressed you know, anxiety phenotype. Uh, and, and you can also use uh, EEG to look at uh, some other phenotype. In, in the uh, schizophrenia, there's all, there's a uh, event-related potential on, uh, you can detect in the in the uh, in the uh, uh, human patients. The schizophrenia show a, a much reduced uh, the the uh, MMN uh, uh, mismatch negative uh, uh, wave, and this is associated with the odd wave. You have a, a constant sound, then you have deviant sound comes in. Uh, that deviant sound is the odd ball. That odd ball cr create this this uh, uh, this uh, uh, event that can be detected EEG. And the uh, our animal, knockout animals, show very similar reduction or disappearance of this uh, MMN uh, peak of the. Uh, uh, so similar, I'd say, uh, we're in the EEG pattern with the schizophrenia phenotype. And if you look at the uh, genetic uh, changes in these knockout monkeys, uh, a large number of uh, 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 cellular processes are altered, including immune system, response to stress, and many uh, uh, also neurodegenerative pathways all activated. This is using genetic analysis, looking at the genes, a uh, large group of circadian-related genes. So we have a knockout showing a lot of phenotype. The point is that we can, uh, we maybe use them for, for, for disease studies, looking at the perhaps screening for drugs. Now, there, there are the gene editing that I show you, these two types of editing, transgenics or the, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 editing, um, have problems. Both uh, the viral uh, expression gives you random insertion of copies that's not controllable. The CRISPR-Cas9 editing has no efficiency, off-target effects, and mosaic expression. This uh, cannot be solved easily. And there are long generation time if you want to produce uh, monkeys. Uh, five years is each generation. I mean, we can speed up this into about two, two years per cycle with uh, some uh, tricks in uh, endocrinology, but it's still too slow. So now, uh, also, the most importantly, you see that all these uh, the monkeys were generated are coming from different oocytes with a different genetic background. So there are, you need a large number to be a model. Unlike a mouse model, you have a cell, a mouse lines, which are uniform, inbred, many, many generations. They are unified uh, in their, uh, or homogenized in their genetic background. So they are good model. 20 mice control, 20 mice experiments. You, you get a good enough uh, statistical significant difference for your, your treatment parameter. So to have a uniform genetic background really is a key for a model. So that's why we decided to clone five years ago, to clone the, uh, the monkeys by somatic cell nuclear transfer. I mean, you heard about this um, method. This is not an old method. It's been used uh, to clone uh, the Dolly the ship you know, 20 years ago. And many, 20 different other, uh, 20 other mammalian species have been cloned by this method, except non-human primate. Now, many efforts have been made, uh, particularly in the Oregon National Center for prim uh, Primate Center, where they, they have extensive studies uh, there for, uh, for a 10 years period, but finally stopped because the, uh, there's no uh, progeny produced. So we, uh, we've spent five years on this and finally succeeded doing this using cultures of fibroblasts, fetal fibroblasts from aborted uh, female tissues. And uh, fuse the fibroblast with a uh, oocyte from a donor uh, monkey uh, in, in which the nucleus has been removed. So the fusion of the fibroblast introduced the new nucleus in, in replacement of the original oocyte nucleus. And that reconstructed uh, uh, oocyte was put into a surrogate, a surrogate mother to produce the clone. Now the key to this is the use of a, a uh, epigenetic modulator, a, a demethylase uh, 
uh, KDM 4D. Right? This is the uh, a, 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 a enzyme that uh, shown by Yi Zhang, uh, I think he is in the audience here in Harvard, to be a very much uh, uh, helpful in producing, to reopen the, the developmental relevant gene that are suppressed in somatic cell. And so that, that injection of, uh, of the demethylase is, uh, is very important. Uh, so here is an example of the procedure. Uh, it, what you do is you use a pipette to, uh, to focus quickly to the, that white spot. That's where the uh, oocyte nucleus. Remove it quickly without taking too much of the oocyte uh, cytoplasm. And you have to do that efficiently uh, to, to have an uh, intact or relative intact oocyte to, to develop. After that, you uh, fuse the fibroblasts. Uh, the fibroblasts introduce uh, into the uh, vitamin membrane between the uh, oocyte cell and the vitamin membrane outside. So the, so the uh, fibroblast is treated with a virus that promotes a fusion. So the fibroblast is actually fused with the oocyte. To produce the uh, to introduce the nucleus, the fibroblast nucleus. Now, uh, the key for this the, this optimization of this procedure took a couple of years by a postdoc, uh, Jen Liu. And he practiced to a stage that he produced minimum damage to the oocyte, very quick uh, fusion. Uh, together, finally, uh, the the oocyte is healthy enough to survive. And together with the uh, treatment critical with the treatment of the demethylase, the KMD4D, for, for, uh, for together with the uh, histone deacylase inhibitor. All these are genetic modifier, uh, epigenetic modification that reopen the developmental gene. Now, the two key, key, key uh, papers by Yi Zhang's lab show that the, the, the uh, embryonic, this is a human embryo, that there are a lot of genes called the... Uh, the uh, 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 the suppressed gene, the pers uh, persistently uh, suppressed gene, can be uh, reopened by using this demethylase. And they identify this, this particular DM, uh, KDM4D is the most effective. So we show that indeed the gene that are, uh, that are suppressed in the, uh, in the, uh, um, the fibroblast, in the somatic cell, can be reopened by using this. Uh, 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 the uh, demethylase, histone demethylase. And that helped, helped to have a higher pregnancy rate and a higher fetus, a pregnant, uh, 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 and as well as a good fetus form, as shown by the ultrasound. So the two, two uh, baby was produced at the end of uh, 2017. We call it Zhong Zhong Hua Hua. And it's very clear that they are clones because you look at their nuclear DNA. Uh, you, can, you can do a ear tissue and check their nu nuclear DNA. They are all identical to the fibroblast cell that we, we fused. Right? But, uh, but different from the donor, oocyte donor or the uh, surrogate mother. Completely different. Using the, looking at the short tendon repeats, uh, that's a way of looking at DNA gene. But mitochondria gene, which are mostly coming from oocyte, that's dominant, lots of mitochondria in the oocyte. So if you look at the, the, the clone, uh, their, their mitochondria genes identical to the, to this, uh, to the donor oocyte, right? uh, but are different from the donor, uh, the surrogate, or the fibroblast. Uh, so, uh, so this is clear, black and white, uh, these are clones. So this was published, and these are two heroes who did it. Uh, uh, Yijin is a postdoctoral fellow, and uh, Chang Sun is uh, the, our platform director. Now, having this work, so they re remember we have produced a circadian rhythm uh, uh, disorder monkey with clear phenotype. So we, took, we decided to took, take that monkey, it's already one year old, uh, we take the fibroblast from that monkey and do the same way of uh, cloning. Right? So we generated earlier this year, uh, Five monkeys, uh, that's um, female one knockouts. And their, 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 uh, their gene is uh, clearly uh, belong to the fibroblast of a donor monkey, which show the, the most strong phenotype 
disorder phenotype. And uh, there is, uh, this is the um, statistics. Right? We take the fibroblast, uh, second passage, third passage is just to transfer the fibroblast. We uh, eventually, uh, actually this is statistic, we uh, 100 embryo used for, for fusion, for transfer. Uh, in the first uh, pass, the second passage, we produce seven pregnancies out of uh, 23 surrogate. I, a pretty uh, uh, about uh, 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 one third, and we produce one life baby. But for after two passage, we have only 55 embryo transferred, only 12 surrogate. We produce five pregnancies and two healthy babies. Right? So uh, it, uh, we don't know. This is a still a small number, but overall the the. Uh, the total efficiency is low. We like to have it higher. Now, in normally the pregnant uh, monkeys, the, uh, the successful birth rate is about 70, 60 to 70 percent. Now, right now, we are, our, our pregnancy, uh, five out of 16 is still low. It's one third. Right? So it's, we want to uh, improve the technology so that we can at least reach the natural birth. Uh, efficiency, then we can generate more monkeys. So this is uh, showing the, uh, these monkeys are really clones. And this is the first uh, clones. So the, 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 the clone shows the, the same depressed phenotype as the donor monkey. So there's no good depression phenotype yet at this time. The, this phenotype, it's very important to have a depression phenotype. Uh, for, for, for studying depression, right? Because we really, this is a, a good, uh, the drug for depression, if you know about it, uh, not very effective. Uh, and also it's a drug that has been developed you know, f 40 years ago. No new drugs. We need to uh, uh, really deal with these problems. Now these are two papers published. When the first paper is, uh, is a knockout monkey for BMR1 knockout monkey. The second paper is a cloning of that same monkey, uh, the one with the higher, uh, best phenotype. We clone this. This was published earlier this year in a journal which you have never heard of. It's called the National Science Review. It's a PNAS of China, Chinese e uh, equivalent of, of PNAS. Uh, this, uh, uh, obviously, this create excitement and debate, which were mentioned by the dean. The debate is, is this uh, approach we should take? Uh, ethical issues. Uh, we, uh, we haven't proved uh, that the monkey model is useful unless we develop a drug with these models. And, and until then, this would always be a, a question whether this, you should just use a, a rodent model. So, why the unhuman model is uh, used for animal model? I've said it, higher cognitive function. It's also a very good model for studying evolution origin of human intelligence. And uh, this is a subject I don't have time to talk about. Now, we want to know how the human origin, how many human evolution come, gives us our intelligence. How do we study this? What is the origin of human intelligence? This is a, one of the 25 questions of science that posed 10 years ago. Uh, everybody agrees, important question, how do you address this? Non-human primates is a, uh, the question. There's a pa recent paper uh, uh, on the transgenic monkeys uh, done by a, a different group in, in China who put a human gene into a monkey embryo and create a neoteny of the, of the brain and higher cognitive function. So now, the, that gene, M -E -M -C -E PH one uh, human gene might be important for this, uh, the origin of the neoteny, one of the genes at least. So this is the way we, we will be able to out, out, ultimately understand what are the genes responsible during mutation, during human evolution, that give us the human uh, uh, intelligence. Important basic questions. Of course, uh, for, the, for the medical purpose, disease models, and the key is to have an ethical standard, which uh, the dean mentioned. We have to guarantee to the society that we are treating an animal in the best possible way. In fact, our cages are now bigger uh, 
and bigger. Uh, now, the, the European standard is actually bigger than the American standard, the US standard. Or the, uh, house uh, in pairs, for example, better uh, conditions. And that's what we are doing. The, uh, the treatment of animals is clearly a, a, a problem, but that's not the only issue. The only issue is, is the, uh, uh, the uh, monkey should be uh, a, 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 a appropriate animal to, to use for, for experiments. Right? That, that's a, uh, another different totally at all. Some people even think a mouse, uh, mice should not be used for animal experiment as well. Depends on the, the extreme uh, uh, point of view. Okay, so if you are interested in this question, the National Academy of Sciences held a, a very good, a very important workshop last October in which I participated. It's called uh, on the transgenic uh, neuroscience research to, uh, the, uh, to, to figure out uh, people from the US and China, Japan, Europe, all come together and talk about the ethical issues and the potential benefit of this uh, approach. And this just published by National Academy of Sciences, if you're interested in looking at this. Okay, I think I passed my time. Uh, I should stop uh, with people involved uh, contributing to this work. Uh, this is a group of people. Um, and thank you for your attention. I was interested in the data earlier in your presentation about how you observe gradations of empathy yes. in these non-human primates. I wonder if you accept the premise that humans are capable of self-transcendence, of unselfish action mm -hmm. that's going a little beyond empathy, and whether you observe that in non-human primates. Right, we haven't uh, followed uh, follow enough uh, so we have to, first of all, create a, uh, a experimental manipulation, let's say, that create empathy that is similar to humans, right? Uh, so uh, uh, people uh, thought uh, that empathy is very clearly demonstrated by chimps, I, especially I mean, if you read uh, books written by uh, Franz Duval uh, on the empathy in chimps. But in monkeys, how much the, uh, the chimps behave. Chimps is very close to human. I mean, human is the third chimp, right? But monkeys are somewhat dist uh, distant from that. The, the similar ph the phenomena that are seen in the chimps are not always seen in monkey. So I guess uh, one could think about experimental studies trying to uh, train the monkey to show uh, uh, empathy and then watch how that uh, evolves. Uh, you cannot do experiments on chimps. They are no longer experimental animals. So the monkey is still experimental. So it's an interesting question. Thank you. Right. Now we tested actually our monkey to, to see whether they can show gaze following. That uh, they fail. <clears throat> right? Monkey fail. After, even after training with the self-recognition. The gaze following uh, they, they couldn't do. Yes, please. Thank you, Professor Pu. Um, I, I am um, very stressed by the depression that is uh, the caused in the monkeys, or especially since they are so close to us. And um, I just wanted to state that I think we should find more human-based research and human-based uh, uh, exploration for these questions and, uh, and we should not be imposing on other primates and maybe even other animals, but certainly not other primates in this, for the very same reason that they are like us in these emotional issues and dimensions. Thank you. Right, I, I appreciate your comment. Yeah, yeah, I, yes, right. Did you find any surprises? Pardon me? Did you have any surprises? Surprises. Were you surprised um, by anything of your findings? Uh, yes. In fact, I, I think the, uh, the very clear phenotype of B-male-1 knockouts 
There are female right now called mice already done. They show very clear circadian disorder. It's been done here actually in, in MIT um, a few years ago. So, but to have a anxiety, a very clear anxiety and, and even schizophrenia phenotype. Uh, if we, now we don't have all the schizophrenia uh, assay for the monkey yet, but based on EEG, I'm surprised to see that these monkeys show uh, psychotic uh, uh, phenotype. That, that was the uh, surprise. Now, I agree that the, uh, uh, unless we show that these phenotypes are useful for, let's say, developed drugs for schizophrenia or, uh, or depression or the anxiety, a, a better drug appear because of this. We cannot convince people that this is a useful approach. But it, the, the, based on principle, you might think that the a model, a disease, a human disease model, especially for this complex brain disease, a, a model that closer to human is in principle a better model. But unless we prove that we can use this model to generate drugs that are now failed for all the other uh, drug development because of the use of, uh, of, uh, of rodents, we cannot convince the society. So we, this is the single biggest problems we are facing now. I think we all can demonstrate this in three years. In fact, we have already drug, uh, new drugs being tested. I think within three years, we can show the society with a limited amount of monkey we are producing, unlike the one that are used by pharmaceutical company. You know how many monkeys are used in by big pharma these days? 70,000 in the US monkey used, just for safety and drug uh, metabolism. And, and how many mice used for, for testing uh, innumerable? But they all, the drug all failed. Right? The, the, all the latest drug in biogen you heard, the AD drug, also failed. So uh, I think uh, the, uh, the window of opportunities there, you know, within three years, if we can, I think you will see that this is demonstrated, that we can use the, uh, the depression model or other model or circadian disorder model to, or even we have other, you know, other models ongoing. Not AD model yet. AD models develop very slowly. I mean, it's a neurodegenerative disease. But other acute monogenic disease, we develop drugs that can, that, that's really effective in human trials. Uh, that, that's what we need to do. Basically, I'm sorry, I, I say too much questions. Not at all, yeah. this is very interesting. Right. So, particularly for the affective disorders, which are so common, right. um, we really think of them as a mix of a genetic vulnerability, but a very important environmental right. component of early trauma and cross-fostering studies show us that you know, parenting is important. Right. So the model you're working on here seems to really stress the, the genetic, genetic component. Yeah. Right. Do you think about uh, yes. Bringing in environmental and right, yeah, we actually for for well, we have a large population of monkeys. We actually now find uh, the uh, OCD um, uh, models on depressed monkey, naturally depressed, naturally uh, monkey that show a uh, phenotype like OCD phenotype uh, among the population. There's also a, a PD, a naturally occurring PD monkeys found in a large population, colonies. So one, one can look for it. Uh, those are not just genetics, right? Uh, maybe combined genetic and environmental factors. Right. So, yes, I noticed yeah. that you had a, this is a general question. You had a number of specific techniques for uh, putting specific genetic sequences into the um, DNA. The DNA, yeah. Um, how far are we, or is it even possible, to where you can essentially generally edit the DNA, where if you have the sequencing of it, which is not too hard, and you want to make it a different sequence, how far are we from being able to? Well, get we can do it now. I mean, that's called knocking, right? You can you design a sequence, you, knock, you put it into a specific site in the DNA. You can, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, very powerful. You can do, you can do just cutting and pasting. Uh, you can do that in, in, in in all species now. You can almost produce any sequence you want. In. Yeah, you can create any sequence you want and put it into the DNA. Okay, thank you. Uh, but
but now to control exactly where you put it in, there are still off-target effects. That's a off-target effect means that you are not putting exactly play the right place editing. You edit in some other places that are not unintended place called off-target. Like over putting more than you wanted. And you yeah, have or off-target. cutting more than you want. Right. Forget. Yeah. Or putting the site not precisely what you 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 precisely precisely the editing you want to do, you uh, accidentally uh, uh, edit other places. Okay, so that's uh, why they had uh, this study where that's called that's so-called off-target effect uh, of the gene editing. Is that kind of probabilistic. It's like a it's it a probabilistic, times? and also it, it's been solved. The problem is now being solved. For example, the most popular thing is, is uh, related to Cas9 uh, technology called base editing. You just cut, uh, change bases, uh, nuclear bases. That, uh, that, uh, uh, that produce off-target effects, but you, that off-target effect can be corrected. Right? There are ways to correct it. Okay. So the, the technology is improving with, with time, very rapid, very rapid development. And it doesn't make any difference really whether you're talking about bacteria or eukaryotes. We're able to. It, do all it of them. doesn't. Uh, yeah, it's all the same right. technology. Proves a lot. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm wondering about uh, issues on uh, sacrification of monkeys, because um, the separation uh, sac uh, sacrifice sacrifice, sacrifice. Yeah. because um, the. Uh, is the psychiatric disorder is, uh, has much to do with uh, connection. So image, the result from imaging is quite limiting uh, in uh, human research. But uh, I, I'm, I feel anxious uh, uh, whether the killing of monkeys for such a motivation is right. Well, um, so. you don't kill the monkey unless it's necessary. Right? For example, the drug company use toxicity test. Right? If they put they they uh, drugs put it too high that produce toxic effect, the drunk monkeys in distress, they'll kill the monkey. Otherwise, the monkey after experiments, you put it into a, uh, you put it into a monkey farm to uh, have nice treatment for the rest of their life. In general, unless they are really distressed, you don't kill the monkey. Now that's the uh, procedure. Okay. Thank you very much. And please join me in thanking Dr. Chen.